I'm very pleased to welcome you today in this Go for Guas webinar. Uh, which will focus on, uh, on um, ways to exploit uh, the grasslands in, uh, in our circular economy context. Um, I'm Benedict Julia uh, and I'm working at Greenovate Europe and I'm very pleased to be your moderator on this morning. Uh, this event is organized uh, by Greenovate Europe in cooperation with ATB, the coordinator of the Go Grass project. So I would like to thank them very much uh, for their support. It's been a great cooperation to organize this webinar. Um, just a few words about Greenovate Europe. So we are a network of organizations supporting sustainable innovation. And uh, we are very pleased to see some of our members there with us today, including, of course, ATP. Uh, so we have a very full uh, program this morning, so I will not take uh, too much time. But uh, I will first like to uh, go on with a few technical details. Um, so as you know, this online event will be recording, recorded and then published online on, uh, on a YouTube channel. You are in listen-only mode. Uh, but that doesn't, doesn't mean we don't like to see your questions. Uh, so please send them to us via the question box that you can see on your screen uh, in writing. And, and uh, otherwise you can also ask your question orally. You just need to raise the hand. So you just need to click, click on this little button and we will give you the, the word at the end of the presentation. Um, normally after the end of each presentation, we'll do a round of questions. So you'll have the opportunity to, to go around that and to uh, question our speakers. And of course, the presentations will be published online and circulated to the participants after the event. Uh, so our speakers for this morning, uh, we'll start off with the GoGrass coordinator, Philip Grunban, uh, who is um, um, head of the research group at uh, um, ATB. Uh, then Romy van der Feide uh, from Wageningen University. Uh, followed by Dors, who will go on uh, with the um, Dutch demonstration site, uh, also from Wageningen University, uh, the application center for renewable resources. Uh, then we have Thomas Hoffman and Thomas Heinrich. Uh, so Thomas Hoffman, who is the uh, head of department, Thomas Heinrich, uh, researcher, both at ATB as well. Uh, they will be followed by Martin Ambia Jensen from uh, Aarhus University, who will present the Danish demo. And then we go on with Susan Paul Rudd from RISE uh, to introduce the Swedish demonstration site. And then I'm very pleased to introduce today our two guest speakers um, who will uh, introduce two external uh, projects uh, focusing on grasslands as well. So first of all, Dieter Kuipers, thank you very much for being with us, uh, is uh, working at Vito on the grassification project. And James Gaffey uh, at the Institute of Technology of uh, Trelly, uh, who's uh, well known and uh, working on the um, biorhenic glass project. Um, so, oops, sorry. Without further ado, I would like to introduce our first uh, speaker this morning, Philippe Grunman. Uh, so, Philippe, uh, I think the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And many thanks, dear Benedict. You can see my screen now. Presentation. Yes, you just need to put it in uh, presentation mode. Okay, is it now in presentation mode? Not yet. We don't see this one. Now it's oh. good. Now, right? Perfect, oh. Philip. Okay. So again, many thanks, you Benedict, for the friendly welcome and introduction. And um, good morning, your participants of this partner event at the EU Green Week, which is intended to provide answers to the question, among other things, why grass-based circular business models for rural agriculture and food value chains in the EU. And I'm pretty sure that at the end of the day, we will have at least some good ideas for answers. Grassland management contributes, as you know, probably to the maintenance of agroecosystems and the rural economy, and to the maintenance of an economic and social fabric in many rural and peripheral areas of the EU. Of the total area of the EU, grassland represents an important land cover, accounting for more than one-fifth of the total area. After the share of permanent grassland in the EU's agriculture area had been decreasing until 2007, 
A progressive increase in permanent grassland area has been observed since 2016. You can see this on my slides, how the colors change over time, and especially the there is until 2007 more light, lightning co light covers colors in the maps, but in 2017 some more gray areas in different parts of Europe. At the same time, farms and areas for livestock farming in the EU have decreased. This is shown in the next slides based on data from Eurostat and compiled by my colleague and her team, Rosa Mosquera Lozada from Compostela University. You can see here in the upper maps how the number of live farms with livestock decreases over time. And at the same time, the land with the livestock also is decreasing. This means that the increase in grassland since 2016, which I showed previously, is not linked to the use of grassland for animal feed. This is a clear indication of an increasing availability of grassland material for alternative uses. Such estimates of surplus green fodder from grassland and shrubland in Europe encourage new developments in the bioeconomy sector. New opportunities for grassland valorization are of great interest to rural communities in Europe. Especially, they can make use of available resources that would otherwise be wasted or unused. This will allow new products and value chains to be developed, which exploit otherwise unused green fodder, while creating new sources of income for farmers. By improving the profitability of green fodder production, these innovative developments can at the same time support the sustainable use of grassland in nature reserves, wetlands, and other marginal areas. In terms of uh, institutional and policy support, grassland is also one of the most widely supported land use types by the EU. Not only because of the large area it occupies, but also because of the large number of ecosystem services it provides, such as carbon sequestration. It also means that grazing activities are key to maintaining and enhancing biodiversity and protecting water resources. And this is very much acknowledged also within the European Green Deal, and it's very much at the core also of the farm sport component there. Furthermore, undergrazing can be a problem because there is a surplus, it indicates there's a surplus of pasture land which should be adequately maintained either through grazing or mowing. The mowing of the land could be ensured if the mown vegetation were used, for example, for bioeconomic activities. One measure in the CAP, measure 60, relates to the promotion of valuable grassland products but only a few RDPs have implemented this measure as such. This is also a lack of measure directly aimed at knowledge transfer and measures that promote permanent grassland and bioeconomy together. Given the importance of grassland in the EU, IEP Agri has set up a focus group on permanent grassland. This focus group aims at promoting grass-based products for a higher market value. According to the EIP Agri focus group, grass has a potential added value which should be used in the form of premium products. These products should help to secure farmers' income, compensate for the costs of farming practices, to ensure sustainable production, and on other costs resulting from constraints, particularly in less favored or marginal areas. The Go Grass project wants to contribute to this by creating new opportunities, business opportunities in rural areas based on grassland and green fodder. In a nutshell, very short, the Go Grass project aims to support emerging businesses that use grass in innovative and circular economic processes 
for the production of paper and packaging. Biochar is a soil improver. Protein as a feed additive. And bedding material for livestock. You will see these cases being discussed, presented, and discussed during throughout the day, especially this morning. It is expected that the replication of such businesses will contribute to rural development, stakeholder engagement, job creation, and other benefits to society. To this end, the GoGrass project can rely on the necessary material, including diverse demonstration sites in the Netherlands, Denmark, Germany, and Sweden, as well as follow-up cases interested in replicating the solutions in Spain, Hungary, and Romania, which have the proven potential and the diversity in terms, in terms of biomass resources, but also technologies and products and services, and the social and business capacity for building up the businesses and developing markets. All this aims to contribute to the benefits, in, especially to specific SDG goals here, but the challenge we're dealing with in the project is to bring these individual components together in successful and replicable business models. Combining these potential mature business models is the way to opening up markets and benefit society. To achieve this, we count on a consortium of excellent partners from nine countries in the EU with a lot of experience in the development and implementation of innovative technologies and businesses. And as you can see in these two pictures on the top right of the slide, the one taken last year during the kickoff meeting and the other one a month ago at our consortium meeting, the adverse external conditions have not stopped us from continuing to work together towards our goal. Even we have had to adapt our mode of operandi, but fortunately, these two meetings were each held just before the pandemic situation worsened. And fortunately also, we are not alone in this, but there are a number of companies, innovation activities, research projects that have similar goals and strategies, which we are already working together or would like to work together in the future. To achieve our common goals. Today's partner event of the EU Green Week is also intended to be an invitation to join efforts through information exchange and further collaboration. And uh, I invite all participants to engage actively in this collaboration with us. And I would also like to take this opportunity to thank the organizers of the EU Green Week 2020 and the EU as a sponsor of the GoGrass project for the opportunity to re realize these goals, contribute to these goals in a significant manner. In addition to the knowledge of our expert team, the demo cases and the project infrastructure, GoGrass will provide tools that can be used during and after the end of the project. And this will include an interactive online map grassland use potentials for a circular bioeconomy, guidelines for the creation of business environments, and handbooks, manuals, and training courses for rural entrepreneurs, policymakers, and employers. Let us work together to create new value chains based on our new screen fodder. And please follow us and contact us. Let me conclude with the teaser question from one of our last videos before handing over back to Benedict. I hope this will work now. Let's check it.
thank you so much and i hope you enjoy this day and this event thank you so much philip for this very insightful uh, first presentation uh, so, as an exception there, we'll just wait until the next presentation to ask the questions, so keep them in your mind, and uh, I've seen some hands raised, so just keep them raised, uh, keep your questions noted. We'll now hand over to Romy van der Weide, the Senior Researcher at the Application Center of Renewable Renew Resources of Wageningen University, uh, to dig into uh, the technical details of uh, technological innovations for grassland exploitation. Romy, up to you. <laughs> Okay, first uh, show my screen. Thank you for, for uh, being invited here. And um, it's very nice to, to uh, be in this uh, surrounding. Can you see my screen now? Yes, yeah. you just need to put it in presentation mode. So now it's in presentation Perfect. mode. Okay, yes. thank you. So, um, <laughs> I'm uh, um, in the Go Grass project uh, um, doing, uh, together with many persons in the Go Grass uh, project, making the overview of key grassland management technologies. And this presentation is uh, giving an overview of that and it's input of uh, several persons, which you will uh, for a big part also meet today in the other presentations. So the, um, what I wanted to share with you is uh, general, uh, which kind of management do we have in, uh, of grassland in Europe? Which technologies we have for harvesting and for collection? Which te technologies we have for storage of harvesters grass? General and more specific for the demos. An overview of the technologies in the different uh, European countries. Uh, for, for as far as they are participating in this Go Grass project. Um, something about innovation in the grassland management technologies and some conclusions. So the management of grassland is uh, very much dependent upon which goal the grassland has. If, if the goal is animal feed, uh, then you want to have high uh, protein in the, in the grass as one as the important uh, characteristics. And then the management will be that you fertilize and mow, and the harvesting will be frequent. The demo which is using this kind of grass is in Denmark. Then your main goal is nature conservation. Then often you want to remove the, the grass to decrease nutrients and to increase uh, biodiversity. Then you will also mow and remove. And the timing is determined uh, by the environment and also by the, 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 the type of nature you want to conserve. Many times it's done one to two times a year. And the demo in the Netherlands and in Germany is using this kind of grass. Another um, type can be um, that you want to have the soil cover to prevent soil erosion, especially uh, on areas where, where there is a lot of wind or there is um, hills. And uh, then the management is also depending upon the environment, uh, the cropping systems, and often you have to reseed and mow. And then the mowing is done uh, one to four times a year, also part of the grass which you can uh, um, collect in the Netherlands. And Another type you can do is that you want to, to uh, get biomass out of uh, uh, your uh, field. That's the, one of the aims in Sweden. Also, they have several goals with the grassland, but they, they uh, find it positive is if they have a high dry yield. And then management of grass spices selection is important and they mow once a year. So then we have the technologies of harvesting. And on the right side, you see pictures to, to have a little bit of an indication which kind of technologies are used. And um, yeah, they, they differ uh, in their robustness. So especially the, the um, flail mower, which is uh, on, the, on the right above, it's very often used. It's very robust and it doesn't have problems with some soil debris and uh, um, but therefore, you also get a little bit salt debris uh, in your uh, harvested materials. 
So the other mowers are more um, exactly in cutting the grass. The technologies we are using uh, in, in the grass differs also with the goals. So in, in um, the, the plate above, that's a, a type of collecting which is very often used at um, um, sites of ro roads. And at, uh, there, the, the mowing and the collection, because it's close to the road and it, it, you do not want to uh, extract, it's many times in one uh, time that you uh, use a flail mower and uh, you also uh, uh, collect the, the grass uh, in the same, uh, at the same time. Also in the Danish demo, which is the plate on the, um, on the on below, there they are mowing and harvesting uh, at one time. And this is their, their equipment. Then in some place, you, um, in, in the, the plate below in this slide is uh, also one where they are collecting reed canary grass in the Swedish demo. But there they do it in a separate uh, way. So the, the grass is still on, on the field and they are collecting it and um, uh, taking it. That can also, uh, often there for this collection, um, the rotary hakes are using and high pressure baling. Then the storage of grass, you also have several uh, possibilities. Uh, on the left, tower silos. On the right, and that, that it differs from the country. I think tower silos are, are a, a, a lot in, in the States and a little bit less in Europe. And uh, in the Netherlands, for instance, we do have some tower silos, but most of the, the, the grass is stored in open pit place silos. And there they uh, compress the grass and uh, uh, having plastic covers over it and car tires. And this, this is the way the grass is stored for one or two years. Then you can also dry the grass a little bit more and then make bales of it. There are some plates of it. Or if it's not completely dried, you can also make uh, bills um, with plastic around it. So all different kinds of ways of grass and also all different kinds of ways of grass, which we can use further on in grow grass. So an overview of this technology. So the several technologies we, we uh, showed uh, pictures of. And here the different countries uh, which are in the um, Go Grass project and the technologies which are most used in these countries. So we see many uh, technologies, uh, some of the technologies are used in many countries. And uh, there is not a, a very clear differentiation that one country is doing a completely thing others as other countries. So, what I presented to you is that grassland harvesting and collecting the grass is a very old technique. We are doing that already for more than uh, now for, for tens and tens of years. And uh, most of the technology used there is very robust. And then if I present this, uh, I got often the question, um, do we, are there not innovations in it? And they are. So I think it's good to, to tell that also a little bit. If you look at innovation at this moment, at this moment um, there is a lot going on with precision technology. So can you sense and predict the yield or uh, sense and uh, look whether you, you should uh, um, do more precision manure uh, management, things like that. Another one is concerning the uh, environment and the biodiversity. Can you increase the biodiversity also in production grasslands by uh, using herbs uh, and um, Resowing with, with herbs in between. Another one is um, the fixed driving tracks and the plates, uh, the, the figures on the right ankle are um, giving an impression of that. So um, in, instead of riding all over the grass, uh, you, you use fixed tracks. It's done often in Denmark and also in Netherlands. Uh, they starting with it with, in research. And there they find around 15% more productivity, mainly used in productivity grasslands. And then, of course, 
the technologies for bioreverenage and other uh, technologies to increase the value of grass as a renewable resource, as we are doing in the Go Grass Pilots. That's also uh, really innovation. Some of the technologies are only on pilot scale, and we need to, to uh, have more experience with that. So the conclusions, there are many types in grassland uh, in, uh, in Europe, and uh, they are managed uh, according to different goals. There's an era of technology, which is all, almost all robust for mowing and collecting, and uh, the storage, and uh, which choice you make may differ between the location, the goal, and uh, economic constraints. And these differ a little bit for the different demo locations and purposes. And if you want to know more about what I presented and the pictures, you can find the uh, concept report at uh, the uh, Go Grass uh, website. The link in, in it is here, and I think later on the presentations will be uh, available too, so then you can use this link if, if needed. So thank you for your attention, and this was uh, my presentation on the uh, management of the grassland. Thank you very much, Romy. Um, so I think we don't have any written questions, but we had some, someone had their hand raised. I'm gonna check again. Um, here. Oh, I think it was, oh, sorry, one minute. Or did the person, uh, uh, Maybe you answered the questions already. <laughs> no, it was Andrew Shunok. I'm, I'm really sorry if I don't pronounce your name right. Uh, so you hand, raised your hand. I assume you want to ask ask a question. So I'm gonna unmute you so you can uh, ask your question orally to our uh, speakers. And Drew, I think you should be able to ask your question. But you need to unmute yourself first. You have the yeah, permission. Hello. hello. Yeah, it was by mistake, sorry. It's just the program is new, so sorry. Okay. <laughs> okay, <laughs> very sorry. Well, um, any other question for speakers this morning otherwise we'll have plenty of opportunities uh, after that i don't see any questions uh, in the chat let me check once again no i think then uh, we'll not uh, lose time and we'll go to the following one and in any case i know philip and romy will stay there uh, in case uh, you have questions coming up later you were just very uh, well very uh, insightful and uh, you just gave all the details people needed i assume <laughs> so Thanks to both of you. Uh, now we're moving on to the, the some inspiration uh, with the GoGrass demonstration first. Uh, and uh, the first one uh, to present uh, the demonstration site and uh, the, the Dutch one will be Durs, Durs uh, also working at the Application Center for Renewable Resources of, of uh, Wageningen University. Um, and uh, so is, is a project leader. So Dirk, uh, the floor is yours. You should be able to share your screen now. Okay, can you see my screen now? No? We can see uh, a script on Word. We, yes, maybe you have two screens, so make sure that you connect the one with the presentation. Yes. Yes, this is working perfect. This is working perfect, and you can see it uh, as well. It's full screen. Full screen, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, invited to this online event. My name is Dirk Burks, project leader of the Dutch uh, demo in Go Grass. Uh, I will present you the Dutch demo for you. And the aim is in this project is to upgrade a lower quality grass to a higher quality paper production product and the reason why is that the paper industry in the Netherlands is looking for a replacement for the wood cellulose that is currently used now 
uh, this in order to work more circularly and more regionally. Moreover, Swift Papier, our project, partner in this project, wants to distinguish itself into the market. And for the landowners, it's upgrading the grass can yield a higher financial return. Now I go to the second slide, and there is mentioned uh, the following partners who participate in the Dutch demo. That is uh, Himstra, Jose Himstra Bruin as an all-over project leader. Of course, already mentioned Acres uh, Center in uh, Lelystad, part of the Wageningen University. Yeah, that is the loca location where the tests is, uh, are done. Uh, Schut Papier in Hilsum who will test the paper, and if the project, project is successful, they will proceed the uh, grass fiber in its uh, paper. And the farmers organization NFW, Noordelijke Fiske Waarden, that supplies the national grass. The, the aim of this project is to create a higher value of the low quality grass. We want to do this by using the fibers, especially the cellulose, from the grass for the production of a high quality uh, paper and uh, possibly also for packaging material. And the, the process is the, uh, the follows. Uh, this grass is harvested by the national landowners and then stored as a xylitz. Uh, the farmers supply the grass to Acres. And then Acres, they will clean the grass and digest it. The goal with this digestion is to retain the correct form of grass fibers and not the highest biogas production, which is usually by digestion. Biogas, therefore, is a byproduct in this process. As I mentioned, the goal is to keep the right fibers and the cellulose needed for the paper production. I will discuss this in the next slide. The low quality grass. Yeah, the low quality grass. Uh, for the test, we use uh, the grass that comes from the nature areas and the land which is under the agriculture nature management. Uh, a quality that is so low that animals actually no longer want to eat it. In the Netherlands, there is approximately 100,000 hectares of agriculture and nature management land, of which about 15,000 hectares is unsuitable for animal feed. And this uh, is, is, a, is a yield of uh, about uh, 90 kilotons of dry mass. In addition, approximately 500 to 600 kilotons a year dry mass of grass on the roadside is available. But this grass is more difficult to use because it often contains contamination. For this, a uh, machine must be developed to clean it on an easy way. In this road, they are state roads or provincial roads or roads by pri private uh, owners. Uh, why, this pro uh, why this project? Uh, as mentioned, the aim of the, is to upgrade a low quality uh, to a high quality product, such as paper in this case. And the paper industry wants to become more circularly and more in use more renewable sources. In addition, the production of paper lots, uh, requires a lot of energy and fermentation releases biogas, which means it's energy which can be used for the paper production. In this uh, project, we want to develop new parameters for the digest type of digesting. Normally, digesting is used to produce as much biogas as possible. That's not the goal now. There is almost not a, a direct, direct knowledge of digesting process to get the right fiber that we that can be used for the paper production. Uh, and the paper industry may also need to adjust it in its production process. That too can be investigated in this project. In a simple but and a simple uh, but effective machine must be developed for cleaning the roadside grass, especially papers and plastics, 
uh, are a problem with the cleaning. And but it's also very important that the landowners get a higher income. What's the challenge in this project now? The problem we have to solve is that the grass for the paper production has too much sugar and especially at a high prote protein content in the grass. And the higher uh, pr um, contents of this uh, sugar and uh, protein, that disrupts the pro production process of the paper making. The challenge is to get rid of the sugar and the protein and get the right grass fibers, especially for the cellulose. And several attempts have been made to find a, a solution for this, but so far without any success. In this project, we will uh, focus on digestion. Why digesting, you will think? Now, the theory is that during the digesting, the sugars and protein are quickly broken down by the biogas bacteria into biogas, and then the grass fibers remain. This uh, research question, and uh, we have two research questions. Uh, for first, what type of digester is the right one? What, which type do we need? A wet stirred digester or a dry, the so-called dry digester? And the second question we have is how long does the grass have to remain into the digester to remove, to remove the sugars and proteins and to retain the correct grass fibers? Is that two hours or four or six, 24 or two months? We don't know. We have to investigate that. And we have done already a small test, a pre-test, with a small stirred digester called the BioStream. This is a mini, mini digester, which has a capacity of three uh, liters. And we left the grass there for, for ferment for two, six, 24 hours and two months. And the grass fibers now uh, are separated from the wet uh, fraction and dried and will be soon sent to uh, script paper for the first test. And on this picture, you see, in, uh, uh, as I said in the beginning, we don't know yet which type of digesting is the best way. This is a type of uh, uh, dry fermentation. We have developed it, uh, and, uh, and it has a capacity of uh, 60 liters, and the test will uh, will we start in, in next November. So we will uh, check if a dry digester or a wet stirred digesting process will be the best way to get off, to get rid of the sugars and the proteins. I will thank you for your attention and uh, maybe there are some questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jörg. Um, so we indeed have one question for you, and uh, I know we have uh, another question that came up a bit later for Philip uh, later on, but first I'll start off with uh, the question you had. Um, so we have Robert Cummins uh, asking, can not ferment the sugars and proteins into other chemicals? So is this something that you could do, or what do you think, Dirk? Oh, it's, 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 it's very Tricky. nice. Nice and interesting question, but uh, I don't know if that if, if that will be the right way. I, I, I can't. Uh, I have no answer at that question at this moment. Maybe maybe later on. Okay, <laughs> good. Thanks for trying. Uh, then I think we have Anke Nort uh, raising hand. I will try to give you the word, Anke. Hello. Hello? Yes. Um, yeah, my question is, um, I mean, you would uh, reduce protein and sugar um, when you harvest the later time. Do you look into this as well? So the, the timing of, of harvest and, and um, site management? Yes, we have we have done some pre-tests pre with uh, so-called normal grass or uh, uh, and also with the uh, nature grass, but also the nature grass, which which is is already I harvested very late, 
um, still contains too much to, uh, content of sugars and protein. So we have to remove it uh, from also from the nature grass. And um, when did you, uh, or when were the harvest time for, for this nature grass? Can you tell? Uh, I, I, I think it's about uh, the 1st of July. Okay, because in, in Germany, or um, the usually um, nature grass is, is mown even later, August, September, and then um, uh, it doesn't contain very much of this <laughs> sugar uh, anymore. Okay, uh, we, we, we can try if, uh, if later mowing than the 1st of July, if it, has, uh, is it can be successful, I don't know. Um, it, I think it depends um, on how, how many times you need to um, mow it during the year, and this is due to um, management um, uh, plans you have in, in nature areas. So you could do the first one for um, to actually have sugar and proteins, and the second time mowing for um, the, the cellulose and, and lignite. And we did some tests with it, and it razor works quite well. Okay, it's, it's, um, it's very interesting. We we have no I have no experience with that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Anke. Uh, I think we have other questions and other hands raised, so we're gonna we're gonna try to make it uh, quick. So first, a question from Federico Dragoni uh, in writing: uh, How the di does the digestion results vary according to the lignification degree? Do you have any experience on this, Dirk? No, not yet. <laughs> not yet. This no. is too early. Yes, and then um, Marcella de Souza from uh, the grassification project is asking, did you try pressing the grass to remove the juice? No, we, we didn't, we did not, but the, when we were in Denmark, they have pre pressed the, the grass and removed the juice. And we have uh, taken a sample of the grass fibers from Denmark to the Netherlands and we will try it also. Good to know. Thank you very much. Then we have uh, another question of Marco Rodriguez Dominguez. So I will uh, is, he lower this end. So I will uh, unmute you, Marco. Uh, now, now you can hear me. Uh, yes. Well, I have a question. Which sugars are the sugars that you don't like? Because basically, cellulose is made up from glucose, that is a sugar. So which sugars are the ones that we don't want to find in the in the fibers? Because I mean, for me, it's kind of confusing because the fibers are, in, are made by cellulose. So this is the question, which sugars are they not, not good for the paper production? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, the, sh the sugar content is, 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 is too high, but the most uh, important is the protein content, because when there are too, too, too high protein content in the fibers, then the the paper will not dry uh, fast enough in the paper production, so we don't focus on the sugars, but we have to focus on the uh, on the proteins to remove that. Thank you very much. Thank you Marie, very much for all of your questions and thank you Dirk. I think now we'll move on to the next presentation and uh, if there are other questions of course we can reply later on or try to reply by, by email. So now I'm uh, welcoming our two speakers from ATP, Thomas Hoffman who's head of department and Thomas Heinrich, researcher, will both introduce the German demonstration. So Thomas, uh, the floor is yours. And we can see, perfect. But we cannot hear, Thomas. Why not? Now we can hear you. Ah, that's fine. Okay. <laughs> Sometimes it's a little bit difficult. A warm, a warm welcome from, from my side. Um, our demo project deals with the production of biochar by, by uh, local farmers on the basis of strongly lignified grass. In our demo project, there are three persons with the first name Thomas, 
Thomas Michael is a manager of the National Park Association. Thomas Heinrich and Thomas Hoffmann, that's me. We are scientists uh, of the Leibniz Institute of Agricultural Engineering and Bioeconomy in Potsdam. Um, the next slide, please. Um, here you see a nice picture of the region. Our demo is located oh, uh, in the lower Oder Valley National Park. Oder, uh, it is a, the name of a river on the border between Germany and Poland. Poland. And in this valley there is a national park. Uh, since uh, the national park was established, I think, in, in 1995. The National Park has a total area of around about 10,500 hectares with mainly uh, polder meadows and seasonal wetland. And around about 4,000 hectares of the total area uh, are used extensively by farmers. We work with grass from this uh, polder areas. And the specific factor is, in this case, a lot a lot of birds are breeding there in the summertime on the ground of these fields. The farmers and we, we can harvest the grass not before the last ground breeding bird has, has left the land. It means for us, we and the farmers too, we have to wait at the end of August to start with the harvest process. During this time, the grass is strongly lignified it is old and it has a low level of nutrients. And in this case, it does not make sense to use this material as uh, feed for animals, maybe for cows, or as substrate for biogas plants. And that's why we are looking for a different way for usage. Our objective is, yes, thank you, is the production of biochar or hydrochar with the help of thermochemical conversion processes. We want to test the uh, uh, suitability of pyrolysis with air or the pyrolysis with nitrogen, or we want to test the so-called uh, hydrothermal carbonization process. And to give you more details about these processes and the uh, properties of these technologies, I want to hand over to my colleague, Thomas Heinrich. Please, Thomas. Yes. Yeah, so I'll give you a bit more details on the processes. Uh, we'll start out with hydrothermal carbonization. Uh, this was developed to replicate the natural coalification process. Uh, so there we use um, high temperatures and pressures uh, in the presence of water uh, to convert the biomass. And on the right top, you can see our pressure vessel at ATB. And this is quite similar to a pressure cooker that you might know from your home kitchen. Um, and we actually use it quite similarly as well. So we place our biomass and water inside, and then we close it up and we heat it from the outside. We heat it to temperatures uh, of around 180 to 280 degrees Celsius. Um, and when it heats up, the water expands, a steam is formed, and once the biomass starts converting, it releases carbon dioxide, and all these processes lead to an increase in pressure, and really depending on the temperature, uh, we get temperatures, uh, pressures between 10 and 45 bar. And then the charcoal that we produce, you can see on the bottom right, that's hydrochar produced from our grasses. And the um, second technology is uh, technical pyrolysis. Um, so pyrolysis is the thermochemical conversion process that occurs in biomass upon heating externally um, and in an inert environment, so no oxidation reactions going on. And again, on the top right, you can see our exp experimental reactor at ATB. Uh, it's basically an oven that is uh, flushed with nitrogen and we usually set it to temperatures between 400 and 900 degrees Celsius. And so when the biomass enters uh, this hot, these hot temperatures, um, it gets converted into three product streams. That's gases, uh, mostly carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, uh, hydrogen, and a bit of methane. 
and then we get liquids, uh, which are condensable hydrocarbons, and then our pyrochar, the solid, and we have a figure there on the bottom right that you can see. And then we also use pyrolysis where we add a small amount of air. This enables oxidation reactions. So these oxidation reactions uh, release a lot of heat, and this heat is then uh, used directly in the process. So the difference to the previous is that we don't need to heat it externally. Um, the heat gets supplied by these oxidation reactions, and really depending on uh, how much air you supply, you get temperatures between 500 and 1200 degrees centigrade, um, while at 1200 degrees it's more a burning process and you get probably mostly ash uh, rather than a char, and at lower temperatures um, you get more char. And this is probably uh, the oldest process. This has been used by mankind for a very long time. Um, old uh, charcoal making um, kilns use this kind of technology. Uh, you might have heard of uh, charcoal production from um, from wood, where they usually made wood stacks and then covered them uh, by earth with a little hole on the top and one at the bottom. And then you would light it up and it would burn through. And a couple of days later, you would have charcoal. And we are working on develop this, developing this technology a bit further in a more controlled environment um, and to produce our charcoal in this way. And these three technologies, uh, we will investigate. Um, first of all, we'll look, of course, at the solid product, but we will also investigate the whole process uh, for its suitability for on-farm uh, production. And there we also need to uh, think about the other product streams, which are the gases and the liquids, and especially technically, the liquids are always a bit of a challenge. For HTC, we have a process water, which may contain uh, quite a lot of phenols, and they can be toxic, which might be a problem. And then from pyrolysis, you always get condensable hydrocarbons. This is really dependent of the temperature, but also how the process is um, controlled. And they can be, depending on the temperature again, um, quite complex up to polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, uh, which are technically really a challenge to handle. But then we'll, so we'll try out and produce uh, char from all these three processes and then focus on um, its usability as soil amendment and then it's called biochar. And biochar has um, quite a lot of influences also when you use it as a soil amendment. So the first thing that often comes to mind is water holding capacity. Uh, biochar is a very, very porous material. So it usually has a very high internal area. So one gram of um, biochar can have between tens to a few hundred square meters of surface area. Um, and this, this helps in retaining water, um, which is especially relevant for areas like northeast Germany, where we have very uh, sandy soils, and this increased water holding capacity might get us uh, through a dry patch. And then, of course, biochar is a very carbon rich material and can help increase uh, carbon content of the soil. It has um, most of the nutrients that are in the initial biomass, so it has uh, components for fertilization, although they might not be directly available uh, to the plants, but it's very stable and so will stay in the ground for long times and become available at some point. Um, but it can also be used in combination with other technologies, uh, for example, with anaerobic digestion. Again, going back to the very porous material, uh, it supplies a good breeding ground uh, for bacteria and has been uh, shown to stabilize uh, anaerobic digest digestion processes, and then together with the digestate, it can be put back into soils. It can also be used as bedding material um, to, again, uh, reduce the moisture content in barns uh, and reduce bacterial spread, uh, which may help uh, in barns. And then again, together with the um, 
with the uh, uh, whole material it is then put into the ground. And especially for HTC, uh, so our hypercharge, uh, which is a very peat-like substance, it could also be used as culture substrates. There's also quite a lot of other benefits, um, for example, long-term storage of carbon for the environment, reducing emissions, and it could also have other technical applications. And yeah, so we will investigate which of these three technologies is the most appropriate for our demonstration site here in Germany. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Thomas and Thomas. So we already have a first question from Robert Comment. So does the high temperature processes allow the end products to be cost competitive? So as compost, for example, it probably cheaper to make maybe? Well, uh, it really kind of depends. So um, at the moment, especially um, high pressure press the processes like HTC are still quite cost intensive as well as pyrolysis still is. Um, so it, it, there's a lot of factors to consider. Um, and I think at the moment it's, it's not yet competitive, but there's a lot of aspects that are not really being considered so far in these uh, discussions. Um, and at the end, you really need a product or you need to really need a process where you produce it in an economical way, but where you also use all the side streams. So if you burn uh, the other products that you get while producing char, uh, you get heat and maybe even electricity, and then it's just one of the products. And then I think um, once it's like a, a combined process that, that, that where, where not only the charcoal is, is what you get, but the charcoal is, is a key part of it. Um, I do believe that it uh, can be e economical and very beneficial. Thank you, Thomas. And we have a second question. Do you think there is suitability to using more severe hydrothermal process for cracking reactions? So um, with severity of hydrothermal, so you have basically different processes then. So if you increase temperature and pressure, uh, you go to a process that's called hydrothermal liquefaction. Uh, and if you increase temperature and pressure even more, um, you get to hydrothermal uh, gasification. So you basically switch the focus of the products. So with um, lower temperatures and lower pressures, you get mostly a solid product, which is uh, the hydrochar. And with higher, the next step is then more liquid products where you get like what is called a bio crude, uh, which can be used as precursor to produce fuels, uh, liquid fuels. And then the highest temperatures and pressures you get uh, mostly gas and that can then be used as uh, yeah, for combustion again. Um, but they are very different processes. Uh, and about cracking, I guess that's more concerned with the uh, condensable hydrocarbons because in HTC there's not really much produced that need cracking. Um, so that's more a combination than of two processes, I guess, where I would go to, if I understood the question correctly. <laughs> And you're popular today because that's not the last questions. I'm, I'm taking another one from Shinat, uh, who is one of our um, panelists for this afternoon. So biochar is seen as a negative emission technology, an option for storing carbon. Have you done some carbon balances to see the performance of your biochar products? And could you see them as a player in future carbon markets? Maybe it's a bit early, but uh, maybe you can still. Uh... Yeah, certainly that, that already comes back to my first answer, I guess. And I, I do believe that um, this certainly would, would go a long way in the carbon market, but only if we, we get the technology to a stage where we use everything. So at the moment when uh, char is produced, mostly the, the condensed hydrocarbons and the gases are not used. You, the focus is on producing char. And then I could see that it's quite difficult because you're also releasing lots of CO2 and you, um, yeah, well, you're not using the entire uh, biomass, but as soon as you, you, there is technologies out there already that can um, 
yeah, properly combust, even mixtures of gases and condensable hydrocarbons. And um, there's development in basically creating a more uh, yeah, a cleaner gas that comes out of the process and then uh, using the heat and maybe even producing electricity. And in, in that case, yes, I do believe that's that will be a big player in the future for uh, carbon markets. Thank you very much, Thomas and, and Thomas. Again, uh, I think now it's time to move to the next presentation. And thank you again for the questions that we had. Uh, we keep uh, connected. So now I'm pleased to welcome Martin M. Jensen, Assistant Professor at Aarhus University, who will dive with us into the Danish demonstration sites. Martin, I'm to you. I think uh, your presentation will come up. Um, Benedict, could you could you check uh, uh, a message? Yes. Uh, oh. Okay, uh, so I can do it. Uh, have it ready. One minute. Danish demonstration site. Um, So, should be able to share. So you should be able to see your slides now. Looks good. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. And thank you for the opportunity to present the Danish demo uh, here for everyone this morning. Um, so uh, the Danish demo in the Cobras project uh, is um, consists of different partners. Uh, I'm um, from in Department of Engineering at Aarhus University, uh, where I have also colleagues from the Department of Agroecology Agro and Animal Science, uh, where we work very closely uh, uh, together in a cross-disciplinary uh, center to develop this type of uh, green biorefining. Mm -hmm. um, also in the Danish demo, we have the Vilas, who is an agricultural consultancy company um, and a uh, cluster for uh, knowledge in institutions and industry, uh, the food and bio cluster, as well as uh, uh, IFAO, which is the Institute of Food Studies and Agro-Industrial Development. Mm -hmm. So the Danish demo, um, as has been represented, thank you, um, is about developing the type of grass refinery that produces a protein concentrate, which is a feed for monogastric animal, um, as well as a fiber for ruminant animal feed. Um, and and the, this uh, is this scheme you see here is the base case value chain that we have been working on. For, for quite some years in, in Denmark, um, focusing on, on feed products. Um, also an important thing you will see in, in this uh, value chain is that it's a very well integrated with uh, anaerobic digestion, so a biogas plant, uh, in order to, um, to produce bioenergy from residual uh, organics and recyc recycle the nutrients for fertilizer to the same uh, fields. Because it's important in, in this value chain that we have a grass resource, which is um, high in protein and high in extractable protein in order to get um, a, a good amount of protein concentrate, which is the main product here. Okay, uh, so I will be talking um, today, both about what we have been doing in Denmark and the state of the art in, in Denmark on, on this value chain. We have been working on it for quite some years. So therefore, in comparison with, with the two previous demos you have been hearing from, uh, we already have a uh, demo facility. Um, and, and I will show you uh, the status of, of that and explain what we're doing in the GoGrass project. So if you can take the next slide, please. Um, oh yeah, the main drivers for the for this demo development is first of all from from the field uh, reduced nitrogen leaching, uh, reduced pesticide use, uh, increased soil carbon in in the field side, 
Um, on the technology side, uh, we want to exactly as, as Thomas in the beginning, in the morning uh, stated, we want to increase the value of grass. Uh, and then we want to uh, push the technology research and development for, for a future bioeconomy, as well as um, make business uh, possibilities in rural areas. And on, on the product side, um, it's this uh, value chain is focused on local production of protein feed to substitute uh, soy meal import um, and also reduce the environmental impact of animal feed. So that's the main drivers. Thank you. So in Denmark, we have had very large focus on biorefineries producing proteins from grasses and, and legumes. Uh, and this is for several reasons. In Denmark, we have a highly intensive uh, agricultural production, uh, similar to other places in, in Europe, of course. Um, but we also have a huge um, meat production with pigs and pig breeding. Um, which is the main uh, reason why we import uh, around 1 million ton protein per year in, in soy, which equals uh, an area of uh, the fourth of, of the Danish total area that we are using somewhere else for our imports for soy. So this is an increasing problem and, and is uh, achieving a lot of focus, uh, especially uh, the, the, the later years. Um, as well, we have uh, environmental challenges in Denmark because we have so much coastline. So the nitrogen leaching from our intensive agriculture uh, causes eutrophication. Um, as you can see on the picture here below in the right side, um, we have uh, specific challenges to apply to the EU water directive uh, in Denmark. So this is uh, very serious. And we have been postponing that deadline uh, several times. Now I think it's in 2027 we need to to apply to, to these rules. Um, and also there is an issue with pesticides because we are using uh, our groundwater reservoir for, for drinking water. And we're starting to see pesticides uh, leaking into that. And then we have the ambition uh, ambitious goal of 70% uh, uh, reduction in uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, already in 2030. Um, and since agriculture accounts for 20% of the total greenhouse gas emission in, in Denmark, um, this is it's very important to look at the, the emissions from, from, uh, from agriculture. And here this 1 million ton feed protein import is uh, uh, significant. If you take the next, thank you. Uh, so there's been a strong academic and political and industrial interest in this. Uh, and at the moment, there are more than uh, 15 ongoing R&D projects on green biorefinery uh, subjects. And now two commercial projects uh, uh, launching uh, one in 2020 this year and one next year. And there's a picture of uh, uh, two different uh, ministers uh, for environmental and food that has been uh, uh, very uh, in on this development as well. Okay, take next. Uh, so, um, taking from the field side, uh, the reason that, that we're looking into this is that uh, um, if you take the next, a couple of just to click a bit forward. Thank you. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, so, so grass is capable of having very high um, production in terms of, of dry matter per hectare and also protein per hectare, uh, while having very uh, low environmental impacts, especially in terms of nitrogen and nutrient leaching. Um, so, so this is why a main reason why we are looking into this in Denmark. Uh, and the picture on the left you see is a a. a uh, um, experimental site at the uh, Aarhus University where we're looking at different crop systems and their environmental uh, impact. Take the next one. Um, so since the, uh, 2013 we've been uh, looking at this green biorefining extracting protein from, from, um, from grasses and legumes uh, going from lab to pilot. Um, 
where I have been working in the development of the pilot uh, primarily. And from, from that pilot development made uh, products for protein concentrates that we have fed to, fed to uh, animals uh, from rats to chickens uh, and pigs and also uh, feeding the fiber to ruminants. Um, one general thing that we have been focusing on is the quality of the protein concentrate. So, for example, how much protein, what is the protein content in this concentrate? Uh, the, the figure you see on the bottom right shows that the more protein you have in the concentrate, the better the digestibility of the total protein uh, you have. Um, this is something we, we found in our uh, early uh, feed experiments with rats. <coughs> so we have focused a lot on increasing protein concentration in, in the, in the uh, product. If you take the next slide. Um, this is a graph where the light green bars show the crude protein content in, in different protein uh, products uh, over, year, over the years and from different biomasses. The biomasses are in Danish, but I have translated a little bit below. Um, and the dark um, green shows the ash content. And as you can see in, in, for example, 2017, we have problems with low amounts of crude protein and high amounts of ash. And, and that has been um, uh, improved uh, over the years and uh, in, in the pilot and, and in our new demo. Uh, which is the the last uh, six bars uh, on your uh, right. Uh, we and we are now achieving steady um, concentrations of protein uh, above the the average content of soybean meal, which is the the benchmark that we wanted to to uh, reach in, in the beginning. If you take the next one. So uh, in 18, we began designing uh, a demo facility, a demonstration platform for green biorefining. And it was uh, established uh, during also 19 and uh, inaugurated uh, last year in the summer 19, uh, and uh, where we did uh, process validation. And if you take the next. So, so this demonstration platform, uh, it's located in uh, Aarhus University in Fulham, which is the small red dot here in, in the middle of Jutland. Um, and it's a national, regional and industry funded. Um, and it's a platform open for R&D. Um, it has a capacity of up to 10 ton uh, per hour input of fresh uh, green biomass. And we designed it in order to be flexible for testing, optimization, and technology inter integration. Yeah, if you take the next one. So this is the process flow diagram. Um, so in in the harvest and, and the logistics there, there's still a lot to do, uh, which is one part of what we're doing in the GoGrass project. And in the treatment, we have several possibilities, but the main step is the wet fractionation, where we split it into a press cake fiber and a green juice. Then the press cake fiber is uh, made into silage and fed to uh, ruminants. Alternatively, we can also put it into anaerobic digestion and make uh, biogas. The green juice is, is uh, uh, processed in terms of for protein to precipitate and the uh, centrifugation of it to make a protein concentrate uh, paste that are then dried into a powder and can be used in uh, feed for monogastrics. Um, the residual juice, which we call brown juice, uh, we're looking into membrane filtration of the uh, organic content there uh, and uh, the fermentation technology for that or uh, anaerobic digestion into bioenergy. Uh, there's a video of, of the process example you can uh, see here, but uh, I don't have time to show it here, but you can go back to the presentation and, and uh, click on this uh, if you're interested. You take the next. So in, in GoGrass, we're focusing uh, on, on several aspects of this uh, value chain. Um, 
in order to also uh, develop it further, uh, but also give really good quality data for all the business case uh, work that are uh, being carried out in, in the different uh, uh, work packages. One thing is the harvest, test and logistics uh, of the demo scale. Um, we have ongoing process optimization for yield and product quality. Uh, specifically, we're looking into a test of different drying methods for the dehydration of the protein concentrate when it comes out of the centrifuge. Um, you can see pictures here in the bottom. Then there are plant animal feeding trials uh, in 2021 and 22 for both monogastric and ruminants. Uh, and then in GoGrass, we are also expanding the, the uh, bioresource uh, of, of grass, looking at uh, biomass coming from wetlands, so green uh, biomasses um, cultured in what we call paludi culture. Uh, as you see here in the, the bottom pictures. If you take the next. Um, there, there is a point that the, there are already two industrial consortiums now building commercial production facilities in, in Denmark. Uh, one is uh, inaugurated here in September uh, this year, and they are uh, running in their process at the moment. And the next one is being built at the moment and will launch uh, next year. Uh, and this is based on this uh, basic uh, value chain, which I showed in the on my first slide. Uh, if you take the next. Yes, so I think that was uh, the, the time I, I had. Uh, but if you have any questions, you are very welcome to, to contact me. Thank you. I'm muted. Thank you, Martin. Indeed, you have a few questions for, for you already waiting. We're going to do quickly and then uh, pass by to the next presentations, uh, not to lose too much time. Uh, but interesting questions from Robert Cummings. Which free grass feedstocks provide the best protein? Um, yes, so, so I can't say that for sure, but we are definitely experiencing huge differences uh, with respect to both species, but also um, to an even higher extent to the maturity of the plant. So the maturity of when you harvest it is, seems to be a more important factor in terms of extractable protein uh, compared to which species. But we'll, um, the, the legumes have high content of protein, but some of the grasses actually have a, a better extractability of the protein they have. So yeah, it's a pros and cons. As, as usual. Thank you. Um, one question from Marcella de Souza. Uh, how is the protein being precipitated from the green juice? Is it acidification? Uh, thank you. Very relevant question. I didn't uh, uh, explain on that. At the moment, we are using heat treatment. So we're heating it um, uh, to anywhere from, from 60 degrees to uh, 85 degrees to denature the protein and precipitate it. This makes it the separation really efficient. Uh, we are also looking into to, um, acidification, um, but that requires first a, a chemical addition, uh, which is costly, uh, and uh, um, and also the separation is much uh, less efficient uh, when we're just centrifuging it if we're using uh, acid. Thank you. And last but not least, from Federico Dragoni, uh, protein extraction processes seem to be highly suitable for noble forage species. Can you foresee any possibility for further improvements regarding this technology applied to poorer grasses and marginal land? Yes, so, so it's, a, it's a very good point that we have mainly been looking into intensively grown uh, grasses and, and grass clovers and legumes um, because this is where we in Denmark have seen the best business potential uh, because the yields are simply too low on marginal lands uh, for protein uh, extraction uh, to, in order to pay for all this processing. Um, but for example, in the GoGrass project, we will look at this paludi culture, wetland, um, uh, green biomasses uh, and evaluate that. And my opinion is that once you have a industry uh, working uh, on extracting protein from 
uh, intensive uh, grasslands, you might as well take also um, the intensive, um, the uh, unintensive <laughs> areas uh, as well um, uh, through that. This is also what we have discussed with the Dutch demo, for example, that it makes sense, even though the, the protein is not the main product from, from their demo, uh, it makes sense to press out whatever you can get out if you have the facility standing anyway. Thanks again, Martin. Uh, now I'm delighted to introduce Susan Polvrot, a senior researcher at the RISE Research Institutes of Sweden to present the Swedish demo. Susan, uh, up to you. Looking good. Susan, we, we can't hear you. We can see your presentations, but you, we cannot hear you. Still not. From far away, yes. You can hear you, hear me? Much better. Okay, I, I have to, it's something with my headset, so I take them off. This happens. Yeah. <laughs> okay, now I can see my presentation. Okay, there we are. Okay, good. Uh, in Sweden, we are a group that is developing a business model and technical solutions to produce heat-treated, quality-assured animal bedding from a grass called Recanary grass. Uh, this developing work takes place at two demo sites. Uh, they are working with the same value chain but with different locations. And Uh, they are both located in, in North Sweden. We have one farm that is uh, located in uh, Umeå uh, at the coast, and we have its West Åkerabård, and then we have Glommers Miljöenergi that is located inland outside Arvidsjaur. We are also cooperating with a dairy farm uh, that is located between these two demo sites, and they are testing this bedding material, and that they also produce biogas. So why do we want to uh, produce uh, animal bedding from recanary grass? Uh, nowadays we are dealing with more extreme weather and more extreme weather uh, as dry and wet weather often leads to unstable supply of straw for animal bedding. And this leads to long transportation of animal, animal body material from different regions in Sweden. And this will, of course, of course affect the environment, but also increase the cost for animal body. In the future, we also think the demand for wood-based material will increase. In Sweden, animal bedding is usually based on wood material as uh, wood shavings and wood pellets. And therefore, Therefore, we, know, we see a need for new animal bedding solutions in barns and stables. Uh, in Sweden, we also have large areas of fallow land and abandoned farmland, and especially in North Sweden. And in these areas, we see a potential in a crop as we can grass. And in, in North Sweden, there is also a value in keeping the landscape open, especially especially in these uh, rural, rural areas. And as you can see the pictures here, uh, the two uh, first pictures is, is a, a typical landscape in, in North Sweden. It's had been farmland and it's now turning to forest. And in this area, a couple of years ago, it was restored and uh, cultivated with, uh, with canary grass. So 
this is a much nicer view for, for the people that live here. And if you're not familiar with the grass, Recanar grass, it's a perennial uh, grass about two meter high. Uh, and it can provide good returns in most different land types. So you can grow it in South Sweden or North, North Sweden. Uh, you use common hay harvesting machines when you, ha uh, when you harvest it, uh, or you can also use common machines when you bale it. You do this uh, harvest in the spring when the grass is dry. And after ba the baling, it can be processed to animal bedding. And if we look into the animal bedding process, um, the process for making animal bedding in the two demo plants is based on the same technology and method, but with slightly different designs and in terms of plant size and choice of machines. The first part of uh, the process, uh, we need to shred the bale. And, and these shredding machines can be uh, electric uh, driven or uh, tractor driven. When uh, the bales are shredded, it needs to be transported to a dosing bin. And here the material is then dosed into the, to a bricketing press. In the bricketing press, the material is heated to about 70, 75 degrees, meaning is the material get hygienized and also the seeds will die if we will use the uh, bedding materials manure after it's been in, in, in the stables. Uh, but we can't use the bricket as it looks like now, so then it needs to be shredded again in, in a, a smaller, more gentle shredder, so we get a soft material that can be used as bedding material. Uh, the next step is, is the packaging, uh, and this material can be packed in small bales, we can use big bags, or in bigger containers, and this depends what customer. Uh, we will uh, deliver to and what they want. As I mentioned before, we have two Swedish demos. Uh, they work with the same material and the same methods, but there are some differences. In the production chain in Glumusters, this plant is much bigger. They have three bricketing lines. And this is a, actually a mobile production plant. It's built on a, on a, on a truck. Uh, but it's mostly used as a stationary plant today. They use uh, electric driven uh, shredder in this plant and they don't have a packaging machine for doing small bale. They only handling big bags and, and the bulk uh, in, in containers. This plant is also integrated with production of, of uh, wood pellets. So it's uh, located in the same building as, as they produce wood pellets. So meaning there is staff available available that, that can, can, can take care of both these processes, which is a bunch of. And the production chain in Umeå is a much smaller production plant. It's more in farm scale. It's a stationary plant. And here you have like a tractor driven uh, shredder. And since this is uh, located in a farm, it needs to be more automated because they need to do other works. They can't be there all the time when the, when the process is, uh, when they're processing the material. So here they have tried to develop a, a monitoring system so they can uh, see what's happening in the process by their mobile phone phones. And typical customers for this material is owners of different animals, such as cattle, horses, chickens, and pigs. But we are mainly focused on two groups, and that's horses. We have a lot of horses in Sweden. We actually have more horses than cows in Sweden. And horses, horse owners is not that price sensitive. Uh, but we're also interested of dairy farms, especially with dairy farm with biogas, because this is a really good to use in, in the biogas production. And it's always difficult to get a new uh, product out in the market. Uh, but an argument for switching to recanar grass animal bedding is an increased value of the manure. Because manure for many horse stables is not used as fertilizer today. 
because they use wood-based material. And uh, the farmers don't want to take care of the, this uh, manure when there's a lot of wood in it. And therefore, it's a, it's a great cost for many stables to get rid of this. And if they use animal bedding from Rika and Aragrass, it can be returned to the field after the use. And we also see it, it's, it's a good opportunity for, for uh, farms that has biogas production. And we actually have tested this uh, bedding material at the dairy farm, as I mentioned in the beginning of the, the presentation. And this farm usually uh, normally use wood shaving. And during three months this spring, they have been using Recanara grass. And uh, some conclusions from this test, it's easy to use and, and, and that there is a tendency to get stuck in the split floor because it's a little bit bigger pieces. And also the amount of bedding material has increased slightly. They, they could also see that dust was formed at some handling moments. Uh, but the positive part of, of, of this test is that the uh, biogas plant works very well with this recanar gas manure and the gas production increased from about 525 cubic meter a day to about 650 uh, cubic meter a day. So that's uh, that was our positive result here, but we're still ev evaluating these uh, tests and we will probably do more tests. So next step now in the Swedish demo is that we need to focus on the dust issue. Uh, we need to um, get rid of more dust in the material. We also need to look in more to the packaging and the loading of bags. We also need to streamline the process and re reduce the work effort so we can get it economic. And we want to more, make more testing of the material to get more opinion from potential customers. And finally, we also will continue to develop the business model. Thank you. Thank you very much, Suzanne. Uh, so we have very quick questions, I think. Um, so what is your experience with uh, silicate in red cadaveric grass, if you have? The, the silicate in the red cadaveric grass? Yes. Yes, it's not really a problem in this uh, process since we use a screw bricketing press. I know it's more problem if you use the piston press because we have uh, worked with that as well when we use it as fuel. But uh, it, it, of course, there there are some, uh, but but it's not really not a problem. Not what we have seen. Good to know. Thank you. Uh, just a quick remark from Jimantas Monkvenas, we, uh, which is uh, one of our speakers for this afternoon. In Lithuania, they're also producing biomass pellets from reeds for animal bedding. Initiative is closely linked with conservation of aquatic warbler, the rarest European passerine. So he said more if info to the organizers. We're going to circulate that later. Thank you, Jimantas. And then there's a question from Shinat uh, O'Keefe uh, from um, our panelists from this afternoon. What binding material is used for the briquetting process? Have you looked at the combustibility of the briquette, which could allow you some market flexibility if your bedding material would reduce its demand? I'm sorry, I didn't understand the question. Was the question what kind of material we use? What bricketing? kind of binding material is used for the bricketing oh, process? It, we don't have any binding material. That's a quick answer. Yep. <laughs> okay, thank you, uh, Suzanne, again. So let's uh, now move to our guest uh, presenters. So I'm very pleased to introduce Dieter Kuipers, um, who is a, a project manager and researcher at Vito and who will give us an insight of uh, the first results of the grassification project. Dieter, the floor should be yours. Um, and we don't see you yet. We see your screen. Ah, yes, uh, sorry. <laughs> okay, you can we see, see everything. You. We see your screen. Just need to put the presentation in full screen. Yeah, yeah I know, I know. And you go. Okay. Perfect. Yes, because I still have this go. Okay, I think this is better and I should. It's difficult. I see myself. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, we see your presentation from our side. <laughs> okay, but for me, uh, one part of my presentation is hidden by my own face. Okay, 
Okay, good morning everyone. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, I will uh, introduce very briefly, because uh, it's only a very short amount of time, the grassification projects and then a bit less briefly uh, the value chain optimization of verge clippings that we actually do uh, with uh, uh, Vito where I am working. I am just one of the many people working in this project and I will explain just uh, a very small, uh, small part of it. So I said there are many, uh, many different partners in this project from three different countries, from uh, Belgium, from the Netherlands and from the UK. And here you can see uh, the different partners that are uh, that are working in this project, and we work in a so-called quadruple helix of partners. So, what is this uh, project, uh, the grassification project, all about? It is uh, it is mainly about the valorization of verge grass clippings. Uh, the verge grass clippings you can see uh, at the bottom. It's actually a uh, divergence uh, near the roads and, of course, uh, also uh, uh, water bodies apply here. Um, the objective of, of the project is to improve the quality of the feedstock and derived products along the value chain. So you have, of course, a complete value chain. Uh, and to meet certain criteria for applications. Um, the thing is that uh, these verge grass clippings, they are actually mainly considered wastes. So uh, in order to be able to uh, valorize them, they must meet certain criteria. And then along this, this value chain, there are many options to improve, uh, to improve the quality uh, for certain criteria. And uh, there is a wide variety of cooperation and research with both high and low TRL levels along the value chain. So, um, yeah, there are possibilities to, to choose for certain types of grass. Uh, there are possibilities to choose for certain types of mowing. Also, the transport can be chosen, uh, the, the way we will store it, uh, baling or uh, silage. Uh, and the way it is uh, in the end converted into uh, a final product and byproducts. But of course, all these choices, they come with costs and uh, potential revenues. Okay, I'll move to the next slide. So this is really in a uh, grass blade, the grassification project. And I will focus a bit more as it is, of course, our expertise as Vito uh, on the value chain optimization of the grass clippings. For this, we uh, apply two uh, models. So we model the, the complete value chain, which means that we need a lot of data. Um, so the first model is the move model in which we optimize over the complete value chain. So we take into account every little process, including the logistics, um, and we, uh, we optimize uh, the value chain on the basis of cost efficiency and sustainability. So we can actually give an answer. Uh, you could see this as, as some kind of digital twin of the, uh, of the whole value chain. We can answer questions like, what is the best configuration uh, also geographically? Uh, where's the best location for each step? How do the different configurations compare and which factors have most influence and which process flows are preferable? And it can really help to make uh, strategic decisions in the value chain. And then a second model that we use is uh, the techno-economic assessment. And of course, this is, this is better known to most people. Uh, the, as input, we use a lot of technical parameters of every process. And of course, uh, economic uh, parameters such as uh, capital expenditure and operational expenditure. And the output of this model is uh, mass and energy balance and uh, total production costs. And a lot of, of course, uh, economic parameters that are important to decide uh, upon uh, strategies for projects. And of course, we can do an uncertainty analysis. One example, is, uh, is at the bottom right where my colleagues did a, uh, a simulation for uh, the growing of microalgae, for example, and then they saw that actually the photobioreactor sizing factor is very decisive. So 
in order a techno-economic assessment can be very useful uh, when you're at a low TRL level and want to decide in the next in in the coming five or ten years what should I focus on to make my uh, business case a uh, profitable business case. And then I, I jump to what we do with uh, the move model. Um, okay, sorry, it's really, I all, always see myself in the screen and I can't see the full screen. I'm gonna try. Yeah, okay, let's try it this way. So uh, the thing is that we, in order to to check uh, many different options that we have, we we decided to work with three demos to model, and we we did a, a geographical spread. So we, we have one demo for uh, Flanders in Belgium, one for Zealand in in Holland, and one for Kent in the UK. And this first demo is about a landfill uh, anaerobic digestion because we have one uh, company in the consortium that is interested to see uh, what could be done uh, with their landfills, uh, whether uh, uh, verge grass, which is a waste product, can be used to uh, provide additional biogas. You see that before uh, this grass ends up at the landfill uh, in the process flow diagram, you see that there are many different options, uh, the many different options of mowing, uh, pretreatments, and storage. And then after uh, after the after the grass has been added to the landfill, of course, there is uh, there is possible. There are two pro two main products, which is the biogas, but also the digestate and. Uh, Digestate can also be valorized uh, maybe afterwards. So this in this first demo, um, the biomass production that we use is actually the verges of highways and regional roads and municipalities based on our own uh, roadside map. And then uh, we have different storage options. We will look at temporary storage, which is typically applied in, in Flanders. Uh, it's a transloading storage uh, just uh, for an, a logistic optimization. And then a long-term storage, uh, mainly to uh, shave the peak because there is a, a big seasonality uh, effect uh, for mowing. And then the conversion that we apply in this model is, uh, is of course, the landfill in anaerobic digestion. But we do scenarios, for example, just with the landfill of the company, that, which is a partner in the project. Uh, we will also check, for example, what would happen if we open all landfill gas installations in Flanders for, for this method, or what if we open all landfills, even the ones that have not installed a gas installation. Uh, what would that mean for the mobilization of the grass? And of course, we also add composting installations because composting is the current uh, use uh, the current application uh, of, uh, of this birch grass. It is important to say that business as usual is cut and collect. Um, some, uh, some administrations let it rot somewhere until the volume decreases and then others send it straight to the composting uh, facilities and then others they export it. Uh, it's not like it's a big, uh, a big business in export. Uh, it's just Belgium is a very small country. Um, so, for example, just uh, just an image of well, some some visual representation of what we then do. We we know in every grid cell what the amount of uh, verge grass available is, and we also know the types. This is not visually depicted. We know temporary storage sites. Uh, those are the storage sites that are being used by the municipalities or the, the, the highway managers. And then we know where the landfill sites are and the composting sites. And once the complete model is built up, we can, uh, we can check what is the best way to mobilize um, the grass. The second demo is in, Technology-wise, uh, while the, the former was, let's say, low-tech, this is uh, a bit more high-tech. Um, it's the, the usual agricultural anaerobic digestion. So you see that the process flow diagram is more or less the same. Uh, but this one is applied uh, for Kent in the UK. 
um, where we do biomass production also of course from verges but with some special attention for the roadside nature reserves one of our partners is a civil society organization a conservation civil society organization interested in to the conservation of these uh, roadside nature reserves storage uh, we we will have to develop uh, ad hoc storage for temporary storage and then of course uh, if if available we will model um, long-term storage probably by silage um, on the agricultural digestion sites for the conversion itself we will uh, model this for five very large uh, agricultural digestion sites in kent know that uh, business as usual in kent is actually cutting and leaving so there is no uh, so there is no collection of the grass so this this means that we will have to set up some kind of um, um, how to say uh, there is no logistics network available so we will have to set up something from scratch uh, that we will have to model to see how it works we can of course uh, look at how it is done in Flanders to, to see what is the, the best way to do it. And then some pictures of what we will actually model. Uh, you see on the top left, you see, uh, uh, for example, some of these uh, roadside nature reserves. And in the middle, a machine that we would like to model in here uh, um, that could do the, the mowing. And then uh, a big uh, agricultural digestion site. And then uh, the last demo, this one is the one that we will apply for Zealand in, uh, in Holland. And we will check uh, of uh, how we can produce best uh, bio-based materials for landscaping and building materials. You will see a picture later of what I mean. But here we will do the biomass productions on the production. We don't do the prior mass production. It actually happens by itself, by the best technology ever, which is called photosynthesis. Uh, so we do this, we model it from the verges from the water board and the verges from the province. And then uh, we will store it again ad hoc for temporary storage and then long-term storage. Uh, bales and silage are some of the possibilities. And the conversion uh, will be to use the fibers in specific manufacturing sites. No, again here, business as usual is cut and leave for 98%, only in some places where there is some additional uh, ecological objective, uh, they do cut and collect. So some of these, uh, some of, yeah, some images on the top right, you can see uh, these bio-based materials. This is uh, some kind of bioplastic that is made from uh, grass. And on the, on the bottom left, you see um, yeah, grass fiber insulation panels that are being uh, made from this. So this was a very quick introduction. I only had 10 to 15 minutes, but I hope I have raised some interest into the project. If you would like to uh, get more information about the project, you can go to this, uh, to this website and you can subscribe to the newsletter. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gito. Indeed, very interesting presentation. Uh, and you manage with the time, so that's uh, great. I think we're approaching the lunchtime, so less questions. <laughs> but um, I would like to give the opportunity to the to the panelists as well, if, if in case you want to uh, to speak to um, ask any questions, uh, feel free. And then we will move to the next and last presentation. Maybe people are still feeling hungry already. <laughs> May I ask a question? Yes, Philip. Thank you very much for this really inspiring uh, presentation and project. Um, I would like to know from you if uh, the, the, in these demos, how, how they are organized, because I imagine that the, the governance structures are quite complex. You know, is it, is, is this like, could this be like farmer cooperatives or um, what is the, the stakeholder engagement in, in this? Or are these rather more centralized companies, uh, maybe state companies, or can you say a few words on this? Um, I, I didn't, uh, it is the model, eh? we, we model it. So um, I, I, uh, I'm, I'm very sure that if, 
if this uh, if the results of the modeling uh, are interesting that we will that it is necessary to set up some kind of governance structure but for now we just do a technical and techno economic assessment just to see what could be the best options and then of course if someone would like to set it up uh, in real life uh, then uh, governance is needed so for now it's just along the the whole value chain we have different partners who provide us with the necessary information but also with their uh, their uh, yeah, let's say personal interest into into uh, into the project to see what kind of scenarios that we can model and um, and what kind of options they would li uh, uh, like to look into Thank you. Very inspiring. Thank you. Thank you again, Dieter. I'm very sorry the time is running. We'll have more time to discuss no this problem. afternoon. Uh, so now uh, it's my pleasure to welcome our last speaker, James Caffey, co-director of the Circular Bioeconomy Research Group at the Institute of Technology of Trolley and coordinator of the Biorefineric Glass Project. James, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can you see my slides okay? Yes, that's perfect. Cool. Okay, thanks for the invitation. So my name is James Gaffey. I co-direct the Circular Bioeconomy Research Group at IT Tralee. Um, so IT Tralee is a technical university and there's a big focus on applied research and applied education. Uh, we're currently in the process of merging with another technical university. So we'll be rebranding from 2021 into uh, the Munster Technological University. Our research group is called Circ Bio, our Circular Bioeconomy Research Group, a multidisciplinary group across uh, green chemistry, biotechnology, sustainability, and business models. And we're based at the Shannon Applied Biotechnology Center in IT Tralee. We're also part of the Bioorbic Bioeconomy Center. We're involved in research and innovation and demonstration action, collaborative projects, as well as coordination, support, and desk-based research activities. And we co-design and co-deliver Ireland's first uh, program in bioeconomy called Bioeconomy Business, which is a collaboration with University College Dublin and Chagask. So I'm going to talk to you a bit about the biorefinery glass project. So uh, glass is the Irish word for green. So it's a green biorefinery project and it's funded by Ireland's Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine, along with the European Commission and it's an EIP Agri initiative. Uh, we have five partners. It's coordinated by Institute of Technology Tralee. We collaborate with two farmer co-ops in Ireland, the Carberry Group and the Barry Row Co-op, uh, alongside University College Dublin and Grassa. And I know my colleague Bram is going to be uh, on the panel later as well. So just to talk a little bit about uh, green biorefineries and why, why this is relevant for Ireland. So first of all, in Ireland, we have a lot of grass. We're the only country in Europe with over 50% grassland. We have a large livestock sector, but we also have a livestock sector which uh, contributes uh, to a significant amount of Ireland's uh, overall greenhouse gas emissions, about just over a third in total. About two thirds of these emissions are um, methane related, about a third are ammonia related. We're also a country that's very reliant on import of animal feed. So we import about three million tons annually, much of it coming from North and South America, bringing with it a big carbon footprint with transport emissions, but then other impacts associated with, for example, biodiversity and deforestation and various other uh, negative environmental impacts. So a big focus of the project is to try and improve Ireland's overall uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions in agriculture, sorry, reduce Ireland's overall greenhouse gas emissions in agriculture. One second, my slides have just disappeared. Um, and, um, and also to improve the protein availability uh, uh, of indigenous protein availability production by using our grasslands in a more uh, resource efficient way. Um, the schematic on the scheme looks on the uh, slide looks at the, the four different streams that are coming off the biorefinery. Uh, so we're producing a press cake for animal feed, uh, a monogastric protein feed, uh, fructooligosaccharides, and then a nutrient rich way which have different applications. And a big focus of our project is demonstrating how the bioeconomy can be taken up directly by farmers using a biorefinery approach collaboratively, for example, on their own farms. So just talk to you a little bit about our demonstration, uh, which took place last summer. Um, so we demonstrated this small scale green biorefinery on uh, five farms in the southwest of Ireland over a six week period. Uh, the focus of the demos was to produce enough 
uh, quantity of the different product streams so we could conduct our trials uh, and also to validate the business model around those new products we're producing, uh, but also to allow farmers hands-on experience of how to participate in a biorefinery demonstration to understand the logistical uh, considerations involved and to give them some hands-on experience in terms of managing a project like this. Uh, this is a grassa developed uh, biorefinery. It's a two tons per hour uh, fresh grass input uh, capacity. And just have a look at the project, the products coming off from on the bottom left, you have the two products from the initial processing, which are the press cake fiber uh, and the green protein juice. And on the right hand side from the juice fraction, you can get this dark colored material, which is your uh, protein concentrate in liquid form and your lighter colored orange material, which is the way from which you can extract more products. So this is a pretty short presentation, so I won't be able to go through in detail all the different work that we've done, but I've tried to give you an overview um, and we'll be doing our own presentations uh, at the start of next year, going into this in more detail and producing some publications and so on. But first of all, I want to look at the feeding trials of the green biorefinery protein products. So essentially to begin with, your fresh grass comes into the machine and there's a mechanical process which separates about 40% of the protein into a juice fraction where it can be extracted. And uh, the other 50 to 60% of protein remains uh, bound within the fiber and can be fed back to the cow. So I'll talk to you about that first. So we call this the press kick. Um, so we've been trialing this in uh, quite scaled up comprehensive feeding trials through our colleagues in University College Dublin uh, Lions Research Farm. So we conducted a feeding trial with 30 dairy cows over a 77 day period. And we looked at the potential of our press cake to replace uh, silage at a 66% replacement rate in cattle diets with both uh, treatments uh, supplemented by the same amount of concentrates. So just to give you a, a kind of a background to the crude protein content of these samples, uh, because a lot of the protein has been pressed out the crude protein on a dry matter basis within our press cake was at 10% uh, versus 16% in the silage. So significant reduction in the protein within the press cake. Uh, the UFL uh, was also lower within the, um, within the press cake and the neutral detergent fiber was higher. Um, so we conducted the trials and in spite of the, uh, the reduced uh, protein that was available uh, significantly lower in our trial diet, we found no um, significant difference in the milk uh, yield or milk quality between the two diets. So it was a really good result in showing that press cake could be a really good uh, replacement potentially for uh, silage in cattle feed diets. And of course, if you can do that, you're freeing up a lot of the material that's in the grass to produce other products. Some of the other benefits of doing this were around the nitrogen use efficiency. So we found about a 20% improvement in nitrogen use efficiency in the trial treatment versus the control uh, treatment. Uh, so overall, even though the nitrogen that was entering the trial diet was lower, uh, much, a much higher proportion of it was converting into milk and a much lower proportion was converting into uh, urea and feces compared with the control diet. So a really positive impact from a nitrogen use efficiency point of view and also potentially from an emissions point of view. Um, one of the other things that we looked at on the cattle feed side was the potential to impact on rumen methane emissions through substitution or partial substitution of silage with press cake. And we looked at this at three, at four different replacement rates. Uh, we used the in vitro Rusi tech uh, technique. So it's just the first indication, a preliminary analysis. Um, and on three of the treatments, we found that the methane emissions were reduced in the cattle diet, sometimes as high as 14%. Uh, but on one of the treatments, it actually went a little bit higher. So we're still interpreting those findings and uh, trying to get an understanding of uh, how the diet can potentially be optimized to ensure a reduction in rumen methane emissions. But it seems like uh, there is a potential to influence 
the diet through the substitution, and there may be potential uh, to have a positive influence on rumen methane emissions. If we look then at the protein concentrate, uh, so we've been looking at the protein concentrate as a potential replacement for uh, soybean meal in pig feed diets. Uh, other potential applications would be in uh, pet food or in aquaculture or chicken feed, or even potentially upgrading some of it uh, for use as uh, plant protein for humans. Um, so we've been looking at it initially as a potential replacement in uh, wet feeding in the pig production sector. There's quite a lot of wet feeding in Ireland. Um, and we conducted one trial to date, which was at quite a low uh, replacement rate of about 10% to get an overall uh, indication of how, uh, how, this, uh, how pigs really took to the protein. Uh, and overall on that trial, we found that uh, uh, there was no, uh, the pigs took to the protein quite well. There was no impact on uh, pig health, dung consistency uh, was normal, uh, but we're in the process of developing a second uh, dry protein concentrate uh, feed trial where we're looking to increase the uh, our replacement rate of soybean meal within those diets. Overall, the amino uh, acid profile of the green protein concentrate is uh, pretty similar to soybean meal. So we're confident that this will be uh, a good uh, second product coming off the biorefinery. I'm going to look briefly now at some of the non-protein products that we're producing from the biorefinery. So you have your press cake and your protein concentrate being extracted, and you're left with this grass whey, which contains a lot of interesting uh, long chain sugars, many of which are in the form of fructooligosaccharides. So what we've been looking at is to try and isolate uh, some of those fructooligosaccharides in the form of a uh, phos concentrate, uh, which can be a prebiotic, uh, which can uh, promote gut health and promote the uh, growth of good uh, gut bacteria in animals and humans, and could be potentially developed into a, a nutraceutical product of quite high value. So we've been doing some extraction work and we've extracted about 10 grams uh, for every liter of whey of this phos concentrate. And we've been carrying out work to assess the prebiotic efficacy of the phos contained within the grass. We've been doing this looking at strains of uh, animal and human cells. And we've been using controls, uh, samples of inulin extracted from chicory and also a commercial on the market phos as well. And overall, the results so far have been really positive. Again, they're preliminary results, but the FOS concentrate that we've extracted from grass has compared uh, quite well with the on-the-market FOS. Uh, both of the samples were a little bit below uh, performance compared with the shikari in inulin from shikari sample, but overall the performance was good. And if a product could be developed from this, it would add a lot to the uh, economic case around uh, the green biorefinery approach. Uh, we've also been looking at using the whey uh, for a number of different other applications. We've been looking at uh, the potential use of the whey as a biofertilizer. So the farmers who participated on the trial develop a number of trial plots on their farm, uh, looking at how this grass whey would compare as a biofertilizer uh, against slurry and also with a control sample they assessed it over a six week period. The grass growth was consistent uh, with slurry. So the slurry or the whey could potentially be uh, recycled back to the farm. And one of the other things we're looking at is instead of doing this approach to look at integrating this with an anaerobic digestion facility, if we were to scale up the green biorefinery and uh, overall the uh, biogas potential of the grass whey appears to be quite good on a dry matter basis. And we have some heat demands within the biorefinery, uh, particularly in the uh, protein separation and also the drying of the protein if we want to create uh, a dry protein that has a longer shelf life. Uh, so we're looking in our economic case about how this green biorefinery approach could be integrated alongside the fructooligosaccharide production, also integrated with biogas production uh, to help with the economics of the green biorefinery. So that's some of the work we're doing, and I know it's just a, a very quick overview. Uh, some of our other project activities that are ongoing include 
an attributional LCA where we'd be looking at the carbon footprint of the different products under various scenarios and comparing them against uh, comparative on the market products. We're conducting an economic analysis of a number of different scenarios and identifying the different business models that could be rolled out to commercialize the process. And we're also conducting and developing some policy recommendations uh, which include uh, interviews with farmers and experts to help to develop these recommendations, which would be developed to try and better support farmer participation within the bioeconomy, particularly in a more empowered and involved role than just as suppliers of the feedstock. Um, and if you want to find some more information, you can go to our website, www.biorefinergloss.eu. And this is our team. On the left, you have the amazing farmers who participated within the project and helped us through both the demonstrations and some of the trial work uh, and have made some videos of their experiences which you can see on our website and on the right you have the core team who are involved in the project so thanks a lot to everyone involved and thanks for the invitation for speaking here today if you want to contact me these are my details Thank you very much, James. Just uh, before we close off, I think we have just one or two questions for you. Uh, there is one uh, from Dale Moore. How does the shelf life of the protein concentrate looks like? Does it need immediate but expensive freezing or drying? I think you mentioned shelf life. But, uh... Yeah, we've tried a number of different uh, drying techniques within the project. The idea would be to try and get it to over 90% dry matter so that it would be storable for over one year. Uh, as I said, in Ireland, we do some wet feeding, so the protein would have to be used immediately or within maybe a two month period, uh, which is uh, a little bit logistically, a little bit difficult. So ideally, we would be looking at drying that feedstock and increasing the shelf life. So we've been trying a number of different techniques. Uh, we think we've got one, which we think works, but again, we, we're looking at the possibility of integrating uh, the overall green bio refinery process with anaerobic digestion as well. So we can use uh, essentially uh, some of the heat coming off the waste stream to uh, produce energy to, to reduce the cost of that drying, but also to improve the environmental impact of the process. Thank you. And very shortly, I think we have Rosa Himspra from uh, our Dutch demo who was raising his hand. So I'm just going to unmute you, Rosa, in case you want to ask a question. We cannot hear you. No, we still we hear from very far away. Ah. I raised my hand yes. uh, some time ago, and my Sorry. question was about the roadside grass, the virgin grass. And the question is, do you do you also clean it? Uh, there and uh, I think it was uh, the question mainly uh, meant for Dieter. Okay, I'm back. Um, yes, th there are many options. Eh? Uh, what we know now is that uh, what the the biggest problem is actually um, for for most of the the grass clippings is sand content, uh, especially when it is flail mode. And another problem is, of course, uh, litter. So uh, there are uh, some, uh, I, I don't want to give the impression that this project is all about modeling. I just explained the modeling. There are many partners who are doing all kind of experiments and tests along the value chain. So there is, uh, there is one action on uh, checking different options for, for litter, uh, con uh, to, to, to avoid litter content, there are actions uh, on testing new mowing heads, which should uh, bring in less sand and so on and so on. So these things are considered washing and, and many other options. Thank you. Thank you, Dieter. Just maybe one last question then, uh, back to James. <laughs> Just a rough idea, what's the lowest plant dimension? I mean, annual biomass processing capacity you can foresee for this technology. How small is the small scale you want to achieve from Federico Dragoni? Uh, okay, so I think realistically, uh, the two uh, scenarios we're kind of uh, focusing in within our uh, economic analysis will be eight tons per hour and 15 tons per hour. So uh, eight tons per hour would be the smaller version of those. 
Perfect. Thank you very much. I think now it's time uh, for me to, uh, well, to say, to, to close the, the morning session, but of course we'll go back this afternoon for more details with questions. Uh, so we'll have lots of, uh, lots of more details to share this afternoon. Uh, so please uh, come back this afternoon for, uh, for the, the, the questions. Uh, this is the same link that you can use. Uh, so just click again and join us. Thank you very much to the presenters as well and to all the participants for their questions. We were very happy to have you here and we're looking forward to see you again soon.